Aging of the eyes is the number one complaint that I hear throughout my plastic surgery practice. So on this podcast today, we're going to cover all the different ways that you can turn back the clock with your eyes. And she wiped off her brows and she had literally no brow hair. None, 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 none. Oh my God. What is that? If you're looking for a permanent change or even a long-term change like you get with Botox for a few months, unfortunately, the answer is no. (laughs) However, (laughs) it does create lines, but though because the actual color actually have been supplementing medicine and really of looking at masters in medical aesthetics, it only takes two minutes a day and it Aging of the eyes is the number one complaint that I hear throughout my plastic surgery practice. So on this podcast today, we're going to cover all the different ways that you can turn back the clock with your eyes, whether it's the upper eyes, the lower eyes, crow's feet, we're going to cover it all in this podcast today. Okay, so let's start by talking about the eyes. And I'm really going to go actually from top down. So we're going to start with the upper eyelid, the forehead basically, and then work our way down. And uh, so the first thing let's talk about are the eyebrows. Now the eyebrows are basically what I would consider to be the upper face. The upper face really is the forehead, the eyebrows, and the upper eyelids. And the positioning of the eyebrows is super important because the positioning of the eyebrows will also have an impact on how your eyelids look. Um, So if you feel like you've got droopy eyebrows, if those eyebrows are descending with time, and unfortunately they do, then that can impinge on your upper eyelids. And the fullness of the eyebrows can actually push down on the upper eyelids, causing them to look heavier. Um, So how do you then lift those brows up back into a position where you want them? Well, the easiest thing that you can do is you can tweeze your eyebrows. So if you've got like the 80s Brooke Shields type thick brows, then if you tweeze or pluck basically the eyebrow hair on the undersurface of the brow, you can simulate essentially a brow lift. Uh, And so what that does is you can take a good millimeter or two uh, from the lower portion of the eyebrow and that can cause the eyebrow to actually look like it's higher. It's an optical illusion. It technically isn't higher. You've just removed some of the hair from the undersurface of it. But this is something that if you do this, you got to be very conservative with it because if you do pluck the hairs, there's always a chance that that hair may not come back. Um, So either have it waxed or if you uh, buy a professional or if you pluck it yourself, then you're going to want to make sure you do it very, very carefully. Now, obviously, if you've got the over thin brows that you did, let's say back in the early 2000s where real thin brows were popular, then this trick is not going to work for you. But once again, if your brows are thicker, if you've got brows like mine, then definitely reshaping of them by preferentially removing the hairs on the undersurface can make the brows look like they're a bit higher. Conversely, if you do the opposite, if you take hairs off of the upper surface of the brow, you can do the opposite. It can actually cause the brows to look technically a little bit lower, uh, and obviously that's usually not what you're looking for. So what else can you do? Uh, Well, brow lifts, surgical brow lifts, are not being performed nearly like they used to be. Uh, In fact, you know, when I first started my practice, I was doing, I would guess, maybe six to 10 a year, you know, a reasonable amount every year. Uh, And then as time went on and more and more people were doing Botox, I started my practice 20 years ago, then the numbers of brow lifts I was doing really got smaller and smaller to the point where um, just a few years ago, I was probably only doing maybe two or three a year at the most. Now, I was doing them at a local hospital, and eventually that hospital basically booted out most of the cosmetic surgeons plastic cosmetic plastic surgeons like myself because technically they wanted to make more money than they could make off of us. Uh, And that unfortunately hospital was where they had all the endoscopic equipment that I used to do endoscopic brow lifts. And so uh, as of about nine months ago, me leaving that hospital, I no longer are doing endoscopic brow lifts. And honestly, I'm really not seeing 
much of a change in my practice because I did so few of them. So most people now are finding that they can get improvements in their eyebrow position just by doing Botox in a certain way. So if you Botox your forehead and let's say the outer crow's feet area and you do it in a very specific way, then you can create an arching of the eyebrows. Where you have your natural eyebrow arch, you can actually arch it up higher. And this is can be a very uh, simple, effective, and easy way to create a bit of a lift of the brows. But it's limited. You're, you can't really get an elevation of the inner eyebrow. So if your inner eyebrows are fairly low, uh, or let's say um, you are really, really arched, then it's not gonna work that well for you. And the other thing that you can get is you can get an overarching of the eyebrow that I call the Botox brow. Uh, and you can get literally like a Cruella de Vil type of a change to the appearance of your eyebrow if you do the Botox um, in a way that, let's say, accentuates it that in that manner. So when you Botox the forehead and you want to change the shape of the brows, every person has to have it done a little bit differently because the actual procedure has to be tailored to each individual's brow. Uh, because my eyebrows are shaped differently than my wife's. Uh, my wife's eyebrows are shaped differently than her best friend's. And so you can't just do it the same way in everybody. You really have to personalize it uh, and do it differently based off of the person's natural anatomy. Now, this is where it can go wrong because you can get somebody who has a fairly natural arched brow, let's say like a Nicole Kidman, and you can over arch it and make her look real unnatural. Uh, there's a very simple way to treat that where you add just a touch of Botox to where it's arched too high and that will cause it to drop a little bit and look more natural. Uh, but sometimes people don't do that and they just kind of like that little over arched look. So Botox can be a very powerful way to create an arching of the brow, which is kind of like a brow lift. Um, and that lasts for about three to four months. Uh, it's usually a fairly simple thing to do. And most really experienced injectors can create a nice arching of the brow, really based off of your anatomy. So that really, when you're looking at non-surgical options to alter the eyebrows and the eyebrow position, it really is pretty limited. Uh, you can do Botox and you can basically pluck or uh, wax uh, the eyebrow hairs to reshape the brows. But other than that, there really isn't a whole lot that you can do. I actually, one, one uh, patient of mine years ago came in and she wanted to brow lift. And when I sat her down, I said, well, your brows are a little bit low. And she goes, no, 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 no. Those are fake brows. And she wiped off her brows and she had literally no brow hair. None, 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 none. Oh my God, what is that? Oh my God, what is that? Like zero, she had plucked them completely away. She wasn't didn't have alopecia because she had hair everywhere else, just her brows were gone. Uh, but she wanted a brow lift, but that was odd because when you don't have any brows, where do you put your, how much do you lift? <laughs> the brows, do you lift it based off of where she draws her brows in? The whole thing was a little confusing because then it's like, well, why not just draw, it, draw the brow higher because you're going to draw it in anyway. It was I was kind of confused. It's one of the few times as a plastic surgeon that I was kind of like, oh, this is a scenario that I haven't seen before. And how do I treat it? It seemed obvious, I guess, to me that if your brow is low, but you have actually colored it in yourself, you would just color it in higher. Okay, so. When we look at surgery, I mentioned earlier that you can do what's called an endoscopic brow lift. So there's two types of brow lifts that can be performed. And what a brow lift does basically is it elevates your entire brow into a higher position. Now, brow lifts do not get rid of wrinkles, okay? Now, there are some people who believe, oh, if I get a brow lift, I'm never gonna need Botox. No, they are very different. Uh, Botox will weaken the muscles that create wrinkles of your forehead those horizontal wrinkles that some people don't like. A brow lift, all that does is it releases the brow and brings it into a higher position, but it does not do anything necessarily to those muscles that create the wrinkles. And so even if you get a brow lift, you may still consider getting Botox in the future. Now there are two types of brow lifts. There's the endoscopic brow lift and the open brow lift. 
The open brow lift is the brow lift that's been around for decades. And literally what you do is you make an incision or a cut that literally goes in the middle of your scalp from ear to ear. Uh, it's called a bicoronal incision, ear to ear. And then we elevate the skin and the fat off of the forehead bone. And then we elevate that forehead skin up and literally cut out a strip of scalp. Uh, and so the way that this lifts the, the eyebrows is that you literally have a strip of your scalp that goes from ear to ear cut off. And then the forehead is elevated and you take a skin stapler and you literally staple the forehead into a high, the, the scalp into a higher position. It is a brutal looking operation. It bleeds like stink because the actual scalp is very vascular and it bleeds a lot. Um, but it really does work to elevate the brows into a higher position. The problem with the operation is that you'll have a big scar from ear, uh, from ear to ear, essentially, uh, that goes all the way across your scalp. Uh, you can get where that scar is. You can get numbness of the area. You can get alopecia where you where the scar is. You can lose some hair in that area. Um, but it is a very effective operation. And this was the operation back when I trained in Beverly Hills 20 years ago that my plastic surgeon I worked with did all open browless and, and they did work really well. Um, now, up until I left my local hospital, um, you know, six, nine months ago, uh, I was doing endoscopic brow lifts. And for the past 20 years, I haven't done a single open brow lift. They're all endoscopic. And this entails five small incisions behind the hairline. And then we use fiber optic instruments to literally elevate that forehead skin off of the bone all the way to the eyebrows. And then when we get down the eyebrows, we will then divide the fibrous attachments holding the eyebrows in position and then we elevate the forehead in that way by essentially releasing those connective tissue fibers that hold the brow in their normal position. So we release all of those, um, what we call the galia and those, those fibers that are holding everything down, elevate things up, and then typically we uh, will fixate it or kind of use some type of secure uh, either sutures or we can sometimes, you, people will put little screws in where you suture the, the forehead higher. Uh, and what it is essentially is a release of the forehead muscles and the connective tissue fibers holding the brows down and then elevating it and then fixating it into a higher position. I use something called an endotine, which is a like kind of like a carpet tack that uh, essentially will click into the skull itself. And it's got these little spikes that hold basically the scalp up into a higher position and then it heals into that higher position. Uh, and so the benefit of an endoscopic brow lift is that you don't have that big, long ear-to-ear -ear scar. The negative, though, is it's mainly being held up by releasing different tension and relying on muscles to hold things up and stuff. And so the results aren't quite as impressive or maybe long-lasting as an open brow lift. Uh, that being said, the open brow lift being such a traumatic um, an invasive operation, most patients would opt for the endoscopic technique. And so if you say, hey, I don't like where my eyebrows are, I feel like they make me look grumpy, I've tried some Botox, the Botox hasn't done it, I'm not just interested in an elevation of, my, uh, of the arch of my brow, I'm interested in my whole brow being elevated higher, the whole thing, then you want to consider a brow lift. The first one I'd encourage you to consider is an endoscopic brow lift. Now, those operations take about two hours or so. Um, I usually would put a little drain in afterwards. Uh, you can definitely get a headache afterwards, a pretty mean headache. Uh, oftentimes, you get black eyes afterwards. Um, so it's a pretty big operation. Even if it's an endoscopic approach, you can still get a good amount of bruising and swelling from it. Uh, but if you want the brows higher, then this is the way to go. And brow lifts themselves, they have really decreased in popularity over the last 20 years since most people are finding that they're getting a reasonable um, result by just doing Botox. Okay, um, so that's the eyebrows and everything you need to know about how to treat the eyebrows, that's it. Um, all right, how about your eyelids? Um, so the upper eyelids are really a fairly simple area to treat. When people are unhappy with how their lower eyelids have aged, Typically, it's pretty straightforward what they're unhappy with. Usually, they, they don't like that there's excess skin of the eyelids. Sometimes there's puffiness of the eyelids. 
You can get drooping of the corners of the eyes. You can feel like they're kind of drooping out here. Uh, and you can get uh, actual drooping of the eyelid called ptosis. Um, ptosis basically is a term for where the eyelid doesn't open up all the way. And so sometimes you can get one eyelid that opens up all the way and the other one not quite as much. I think a good example of this, if I'm correct, would be Forrest Whitaker. I think Forrest Whitaker has one eyelid that has eyelid ptosis, that is totic, that doesn't open up all the way, and the other one that does open up all the way. Uh, now, if you've got an eyelid that is totic, that doesn't open up all the way, then insurance will oftentimes pay for a ptosis repair where you can actually cause the eyelid to open up more and try to even how much those eyelids open so that they open up the same amount. This is typically paid for if your eyelid doesn't open up enough that you have it impinging on your vision. Uh, and so once again, if that's an issue that you may have, then that is something that insurance can help cover potentially. It is not considered a traditional cosmetic surgery. Uh, I actually don't do ptosis repair. Um, I usually send that to ophthalmologists who have specialized training in plastic surgery of the eyelids. Um, and so ptosis repair is more of a reconstructive surgery. I don't consider it to be so much cosmetic, um, but oftentimes ptosis repair is combined with a blepharoplasty or an eyelid lift. So uh, before we get to surgical options for the upper eyelid, is there anything non-surgical that you can do for the upper eyelid? Well, unfortunately, not really. Uh, if you are using eyelid creams, then I would encourage you to, to definitely apply it onto the upper eyelid skin. Other than that, really, there's no, I mean, you can laser it, but not really, you can't, you gotta be really careful with lasering it just because the eyelid skin is so thin that you don't wanna cause a burn to the eyelid necessarily. Um, and that's really it. There just isn't a whole lot non-surgical that you can do with the upper eyelids. Now, the good news though, is if you're unhappy with your upper eyelids, then an upper blepharoplasty, the operation to remove the excess skin is usually quite straightforward and usually very well tolerated. I do a lot of upper blepharoplasty surgery. So what is that operation? Well, basically during an upper blepharoplasty, we remove the excess skin of the upper eyelid by literally cutting that skin out. That does leave a scar that goes all the way across the eyelid. That scar is permanent it almost never thickens, it almost never becomes a keloid or anything like that, um, but it can be visible, especially if you're closing your eye. Now, when I do this operation, especially on Caucasians, they usually will have a, what we call a supratarsal crease. It's a crease of the upper eyelid. And I, in general, will try to hide that scar in that crease. Um, and so the first step, really, of that eyelid surgery is to make the incision and to cut out the excess skin. Now at that time, you can also we can also remove a little bit of puffy fat. So if you feel like your upper eyelids are kind of puffy, then removing fat from the upper eyelids in a very conservative manner can help to reduce that puffiness and cause your eyelids to open up a touch more. Um, now insurance may cover an upper blepharoplasty if you've got so much excess skin of your upper eyelids that is hooding over and let's say you can't see traffic lights and stuff at night and stuff, and it really is impinging on your vision, then I would encourage you before you see, let's say a plastic surgeon for an upper blepharoplasty to see your ophthalmologist and to get testing to see whether you might get that covered by your insurance. Uh, because oftentimes uh, if let's say you're older, you know, the classic example of somebody who gets their eyelids covered by insurance is a man who's in their 70s or 80s and just has so much excess skin that they can barely open their eyes and you don't see this, you don't even see the eyelid itself because there's so much skin hanging over it. Those are the types of people that usually will get covered by insurance and, and some others might as well. Um, also very important with upper blepharoplasty, this operation can be feminizing. Uh, and if you do it the same way on a guy as you do on a woman, unless that man wants to look feminized, then you can really make that person look quite different and they may not be happy with it. And so whenever I do blepharoplasty on men, uh, upper blepharoplasty, I'm always very careful not to remove a whole lot of skin because if you remove the maximum amount of skin that you can, which is usually what I do in most women uh, because they don't really want extra skin in their eyelids, then it can make the man look overly open. There are some examples of this. Kenny Rogers, the late Kenny Rogers, uh, had an upper blepharoplasty surgery and it changed how he looked. And he actually admitted that his doctor told him he took off too much skin. 
Uh, I do believe, and I have absolutely zero evidence of this that he has admitted to it, but I think Robert Redford has uh, likely had his eyelids done in the past. Uh, and I do think the late uh, Burt Reynolds had his eyelids done as well. Um, so those are just some examples. Oh, how could I forget? Possibly the most upfront out there example of an upper blepharoplasty, my opinion, in a guy is President Joe Biden. You know, I think President Biden has had his upper and his lower eyelids done. We can talk about that in a little bit too. Um, so you got to exercise caution. If you're a guy and you're considering this operation, you know, for me, I always leave a little bit of skin there uh, on the eyelid because you can always come back and remove more skin if you want. But if you take too much skin, especially off a guy, that can really change how he looks and he may be very unhappy with it. That's different with women because this operation really um, is designed for the more feminine upper eyelid anyway. And so for a, a female, I'm usually definitely more aggressive with skin removal. Now, there are some ancillary procedures that you can do with an upper blepharoplasty, meaning add-on procedures. One of them I mentioned earlier is the ptosis repair. So if you've got a droopy upper eyelid, and let's say one eyelid doesn't open up as much as the other, then that eyelid can be repaired uh, so it opens up the same amount as the other side. That can be done at the same time as a cosmetic upper blepharoplasty. Um, there's also kind of unusual procedures that are being done. One's called a canthopexy. Another name for that is a cat eye or a fox eye surgery. And this is where you take basically the, um, we call the lateral canthus or the corner of the eyelid on the outer portion of the eyelid. You detach it and you reattach it up higher so that it literally slants your eyelid upward, making it look more cat eye or fox eye. Some doctors are even trying to do this just by using barbed sutures or threads. That result may only last about six months or so, but if you do a true canthopexy where you literally detach the corner of the eyelid and reattach it higher, that result can last forever. Um, now, this is a procedure that um, is usually performed by ophthalmic plastic surgeons, by ophthalmologists who have specialized training in reconstructive surgery of the upper eyes. In general, most plastic surgeons like myself, general plastic surgeons where we do kind of face, we do body surgery, we do breast surgery, we do kind of a lot of things. You got to be careful if you have one of them do this operation on you because you don't want them dabbling in this operation. Uh, this definitely is something that's very meticulous and you want somebody who does a lot of them to do this if you're going to consider a canthopexy. Uh, and it's not a super common operation. And so that's why in general, I recommend seeing ophthalmic plastic surgeons for this once again, ophthalmologists who do plastic surgery because most likely they're doing a lot more of these than general plastic surgeons like myself. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of that uh, kind of cat eye uh, approach because honestly, I, I think it looks unnatural. Uh, there are some celebrities that have been accused of having it done. I think Bella Hadid may be the most um, widely, I guess, uh, a person who's shown for this kind of fox eye or cat eye procedure. Um, but other celebrities, um, I think people have accused Ariana Grande of having something like that done. If if she did, I think maybe it was done with threads. Um, and then also, I think Kendall Jenner may have been accused of that as well. Once again, I think as she did it, my guess is it was probably with threads, not a surgical canthopexy that's going to give a long lasting result. Okay, so that's really the upper blepharoplasty. The upper blepharoplasty surgery takes about an hour. Um, I perform it either under, under sedation or a general anesthetic. Technically, you can do it under a local anesthetic in a person's office as well. It does leave you with a scar in the crease of the upper eyelid afterwards. Um, usually, people don't take any pain pills at all, and the recovery is very simple. You know, you, you just look kind of beat up for a week or two, uh, but usually people tolerate this operation very well. Uh, and the main, I guess, thing you want to watch out for is just overdoing, removing too much skin. If the patient cannot close their eye afterwards, that's the thing we always worry about. So it's being aggressive enough that we are removing enough skin to create the result we're looking for, but not so much skin that literally their eyelid won't close. That's a bad situation. Okay, so how about the crow's feet? So we're move, moving our way down. We went from the, the eyebrows to the upper eyelids. Now we're looking at the crow's feet. The crow's feet are those radiating wrinkles that go radiate out from the corners of your eyelids. And those wrinkles are called crow's feet because they look like a 
grow a crow's foot, I guess. And these are caused by contraction of the orbicularis oculi muscle. This is a circular muscle that goes all the way around your eyeball or your eye socket, essentially. And as that muscle contracts, it causes these wrinkles to form around your eyes. So the treatment really is that you want to, number one, avoid getting them. And so how do you avoid getting those wrinkles? You want to limit the squinting that you do. Now you create those lines when you smile. I don't encourage you to stop smiling, but I can encourage you to stop squinting. And one way to reduce the amount of squinting that you do is to wear sunglasses. Uh, sunglasses are, ver are a very simple way to prevent crow's feet wrinkles because you're gonna squint less because, hey, you know, you're not in this, you know, your eyes aren't needing to squint to reduce the amount of light coming into them. Um, and so sunglasses, a great way to prevent uh, crow's feet wrinkles. So how do you treat it? Well, in general, the best way to treat crow's feet wrinkles is to target the cause of the wrinkles. And what, are, what is the cause once again? It is the contraction of those orbicularis oculi muscles. And what treatment prevents contraction of muscles? Botox. And so injecting small amounts of Botox into that orbicularis muscle can weaken that muscle for about three to four months uh, and prevent those crow's feet wrinkles from forming. Um, you can try Daxify. Daxify is a newer, longer lasting Botox alternative. You may be able to get six months out of Daxify. Um, now, what about laser treatments or chemical peels or let's say Morpheus 8 treatments like that? Will that help with the crow's feet? Well, those types of treatments will only help a little bit because these wrinkles are, ca are called dynamic wrinkles. They're caused by those muscles. And in general, dynamic wrinkles are not well treated by static treatments like lasers, like radiofrequency, like chemical peels, um, because all those, those types of treatments are gonna do is they're gonna treat the surface to try to smooth out the surface. But you're not treating the root cause of those wrinkles, once again, which is the muscle. So in general, if you wanna treat crow's feet wrinkles, really the best way to do it is Botox. There really is no other good option. Anything else that you do, once again, from lasers to peels and stuff, it really is gonna do very minimal. Uh, Botox definitely is a way to go. Okay, so that's crow's feet. Now let's work our way down to the lower eyelids. And unlike the upper eyelids, where the upper eyelids basically is just excess skin, maybe with a little bit of fat, the lower eyelids are much more complicated. Um, and so the treatment for the lower eyelids needs to be targeted towards the cause of the problem. So what we're gonna do for the rest of this podcast is I'm gonna go over each of the different causes of lower eyelid problems, and then how do you basically treat it? Uh, the first thing is going to be puffiness or bags under the eyes. Now, the eyeball is enclosed in the eye socket, and this is a cone of bone. And inside that cone of bone is a bunch of fat. And that fat is there to basically cushion and protect the eyeball and the optic nerve and the other types of blood vessels and the muscles of the eye as well. Now, when you get older, and it can occur due to genetics, the fat that's in the lower eyelid in that fat compartment, okay, can start to protrude. And there are three fat compartments of each lower eyelid. There's a medial fat compartment that's towards the eye, that's towards the nose. There's a central fat compartment that's in the middle and the lateral fat compartment that's off to the side. And when fat protrudes from these compartments, it can cause a person to have bags under their eyes. So if you know somebody who's got very prominent lower eyelid bags, Look at them really closely. See if you can tell where those three fat compartments are because oftentimes you actually can spot those fat compartments because they can be quite separated. Not in everybody. In some people, there's just one big kind of continuous looking bag or puffiness under their eye. But in some people, you can actually see where those pockets specifically are. It's pretty interesting. So how do you then get rid of puffiness or bags? Well, Basically, you have to remove the fat, and you do that with a lower blepharoplasty. It has to be done surgically. So the way that I do it is I make an incision on the inside of the eyelid, on the inner mucosa or the conjunctiva of the eyelid, and I tease fat out of those three fat compartments. The fat is removed. I put one little stitch on the inside that dissolves on its own, and then we're done. That literally will depuff the eyelids by taking that fat out. 
Now we can also do what's called a pinch approach, where in addition to removing fat from the inside of the eyelid, I can make an incision right underneath the eyelashes and remove a pinch of extra skin as well. So this will remove not only fat, but also skin with it. Um, there's also a traditional blepharoplasty where the incision is just made in the front of the eyelid. You have to cut through, unfortunately, the muscle layer and then take the fat out from there. That approach is not done as commonly anymore because it has a higher risk of the eyelid pulling down afterwards. And this is definitely a complication that you do not want. And so in general, in my practice, I typically would do what's called a quote unquote scarless or transconjunctival approach where the fat is removed just from the inside of the eyelid and nothing else done. Or I combine that with a pinch where I also take out a pinch of excess skin from the front of the eyelid, leaving a scar underneath the eyelashes. Now, like in an upper blepharoplasty, that scar can be visible, but it almost never gets thick. Uh, and so it usually heals really, really nicely. Um, so, so that's a way, that's really the only way to permanently get rid of lower eyelid bags. It's by removing that fat and then also taking a bit of skin depending on the situation. Now, I do believe that this fat runs in families. I have seen patients of mine who are in their early to mid 30s and they've had big bags under their eyes and we've taken them out using the scarless te uh, technique. Uh, oftentimes we can do that without adding the pinch, without adding a, an additional scar in the front of the eyelid because usually their skin is usually quite tight because they're on the younger side. However, if let's say you're in your 60s or 70s and you have it done, then unfortunately that skin is usually not retractile enough, I guess, tight enough that you can remove the fat without taking skin with it. And usually then once people are in their 60s and 70s, I'll do the pinch approach where we also take skin in addition to the fat. When somebody is in their 50s, it depends on their individual anatomy. So usually 30s and 40s, I do scarless. 60s and 70s, I do the pinch. And in the 50s, it really just depends on the patient. Um, so there are risks of this operation. Main risk is removing too much skin, or if you go through the traditional approach, and especially if you remove a lot of skin with the traditional approach, the main thing we worry about is that eyelid pulling down. And that's called an ectropion, or a lid retraction. And that can be very, very hard to fix. Uh, and so make sure that if you're considering a lower blepharoplasty surgery, that you are very careful to choose the right surgeon, somebody who's gonna do it safely, ideally a transconjunctival or a pinch approach, uh, and somebody who is not gonna be overly aggressive with removal of the skin. Now, is there anything you can do for the puffiness though that's non-surgical? Well, if you're looking for a permanent change or even a long-term change, like you get with Botox for a few months, unfortunately, the answer is no. This is actually physical fat that you have to remove to reduce that puffiness. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, there is one type of treatment that can help with it significantly, but it's very temporary. There are temporary eyelid tightening creams or serums that you can buy. One of them is the Philip Thomas Roth Instant Tightening Cream. This went viral actually on TikTok many years ago. Uh, and what it is essentially, the best way to describe it, it's like the feeling that you get on your skin if you take uh, Elmer's glue and you let it dry on your skin. Um, and so essentially you take this serum or this cream and the cream will dry on your skin, on your eyelid. And as it does, it shrinks down and it can shrink down pretty significantly to actually really reduce visible puffiness. Uh, so this can really work in those cases where you're looking for a very temporary result, maybe for a few hours, maybe you've got a date, you've got a, a class reunion, you're going to a party or a wedding, then this type of treatment can really help for a few hours to get you, you know, to make it so that those bags are gone from your lower eyelids. Just keep in mind that when it wears off, those bags come back. And so if you do have a longer event, bring that product with you so you can potentially reapply it. And also you gotta be aware, because essentially these products are films that they leave a film on the surface of your skin, sometimes it's hard to put makeup over it. And depending on the light, somebody might be able to see that film on your eyelid. But they do work and it's not surgery. <laughs> so instant tightening creams like the Philip Thomas Roth, they do work if you wanna go that way. Okay, so the first thing in the lower eyelids is puffiness. 
Uh, that puffiness actually can cause shadowing, which can cause dark circles under the eyes too. Uh, and so some people, they come in to see me, they go, oh, I don't like the dark circles under my eyes. They may not say don't like the puffiness. They may say, I don't like the dark circles. In reality, I look at them and I can tell by looking how puffy their eyelids are, is the dark circles due to the puffiness causing shadowing or is it due to something else, okay? And so removing the puffiness can definitely remove dark circles, especially if that puffiness is severe. Well, the next issue that people can get for the lower eyelids are wrinkles. Uh, you can get wrinkles of that uh, and thinning of the skin of the lower eyelid there. Uh, and so that basically, the wrinkles of the lower eyelid is due to thinning of the skin combined with muscle contractions. And the contractions are the orbicularis muscle, the one that I mentioned earlier with the crow's feet. So how do you treat wrinkles of the lower eyelid? Well, in general, it's like how you treat fine lines of the rest of the face. It's gonna be using creams like a retinoid. Um, so we have at my Yoon Beauty um, uh, line, we have our retinol eye cream and retinol is made to basically thicken collagen. And the other thing that you can use are peptide creams. Peptides are basically chemical messengers. They're small proteins that act as chemical messengers to signal your cells to create more collagen. Uh, and so for the lower eyelids, that's what I recommend typically as a retinol eye cream, uh, as well as a peptide cream. And we have a peptide and bakuchel moisturizer in our skincare line, Yoon Beauty as well, that I think both of those are great if you wanna put those on your eyelids. The retinol eye cream and the peptide and bakuchel moisturizer. And then the other thing you can do for wrinkles is a fractional laser treatment. Lasers can help to zap those wrinkles under the eyes. They basically cause the skin to shrink a bit and they can help to thicken some of the collagen of the skin and that can help smooth the eyelids as well. Um, so what I usually recommend is, you know, if you're on the younger side, the wrinkles are not severe, then yeah, definitely use the retinol eye cream and then would recommend a peptide cream as well, like our peptide and bakuchel moisturizer. If, however, you're a bit older and those wrinkles are pretty inset and you want to be more aggressive with treating them, then I would go after a fractional laser. Usually chemical peels and radiofrequency, microneedling, those are not usually, in my opinion, the best for the lower eyelids, just because the lower eyelid skin is so thin that any treatment you do to it, you wanna make sure it's very uniform. You can't get more uniform than these lasers that are very accurate in just what they do each time the same treatment. Um, versus let's say if you're putting a chemical peel on somebody's eyelid and maybe you have a little more acid on one side than the other and it's hard to tell if you put a little more acid here or there, you know, the actual fractional laser is gonna be much more accurate in the actual depth of that treatment. Uh, and that's why I recommend fractional lasers for the lower eyelids. Okay, so we talked about puffiness, we've talked about wrinkles, um, but what if your issue is just in general dark circles? Well, dark circles, as I mentioned earlier, can be caused by puffiness. If you've got severe puffiness, that can cause shadowing, that can create dark circles under the eyes. But dark circles can also be caused by pigment. Uh, if you've got, let's say, darker skin tones, sometimes people will deposit pigment in that area. And it can also be due to people uh, having their skin get thinner. So if you get real thin and crepey skin of the lower eyelids, sometimes it, that skin can be so thin, it can be transparent, and it can allow you actually to see some of the dark blood vessels underneath. And so there's three main causes of dark circles under the eyes. Puffiness, which is treated by surgery. Uh, it can be pigment, which I do recommend brightening creams for that. Uh, combining ideally a brightening cream with a retinoid because a retinoid is gonna get better penetration of that. Uh, and then the third thing is gonna be thinning of that skin, causing that skin to look uh, tr potentially transparent. So once again, if it's pigment, then my recommendation would be to use a brightening cream. Uh, brightening creams can contain niacinamide, kojic acid, licorice root extract, um, sometimes uh, tea, uh, like there's one called tiamine that helps with that too. Um, so. Uh, tea is another way to reduce some of that pigment. Uh, and ideally, if you want to combine that with a retinol eye cream, now you're going to get a little better penetration and potentially better results. Um, you can go with a designated brightening cream that's just for the eyelids, or you can get one that's for the whole face. In general, brightening creams, unless you're using something like hydroquinone, which is prescription strength, 
Um, the over-the-counter stuff, most of the time, unless you've got super sensitive eyelid skin, you can use the same brightening cream on your face that you use on your eyelids. Um, just if you've got really sensitive skin, then you may want to start by doing it maybe every other night, that type of thing. And then once again, adding in that retinol eye cream is what I would recommend. Okay, well, what about the dark circles um, if they're due to thinning of the skin, creating transparency? Uh, well, then I do recommend a retinol eye cream because once again, that retinol can help to thicken that skin, thicken the dermis of the skin. Uh, retinol eye creams really, and no matter what your lower eyelid issue, I do recommend a retinol eye cream for almost everybody once you become an adult. Okay, and then how about hollowing? Okay, I, t I mentioned to you earlier, as we started talking about lower eyelids, it's, lower eyelids are complicated. You get puffiness, you know, you could get wrinkles, you can get dark circles, but you can also get hollowing of the eyes too. And that hollowing is something that can be a combination of aging as well as genetics. And unfortunately, the only way to treat it is invasively, is to either inject filler or fat. Filler is what I usually recommend because you can inject the tiniest amounts. It can be very accurately placed. The key with injections of filler in the lower eyelids is you want to make sure that it is done very conservatively. Definitely less is more. And injecting less than half a syringe, like 0.3 or 0.4 cc's in each lower eyelid, oftentimes is sufficient filler to fill in what you're looking for. Um, there are certain fillers that you should not use under the eyelids. In general, I love Juvederm products, just not for that area. Go more with Restylane type products, products that do not absorb moisture because you do not want to have lumpiness under the eyes. The main issue that people get when they inject filler under the eyes is lumpiness. Because that skin, that tissue is so, so thin, the injector has to be so incredibly careful to make sure that just the tiniest amounts are injected and that that risk of lumpiness is minimized. So we've talked about a lot of different ways to target different things with your eyelids. So where do you start? If you say, well, geez, you covered so much in this podcast, Dr. Yoon, I don't know where to start. What should I start by doing? Here's something very simple. Number one, you wanna start with a retinol eye cream. I mentioned earlier throughout this podcast how I'm a big fan of retinol eye creams. You know, one of our big sellers at Yoon Beauty is our Yoon Beauty Retinol Eye Cream. Uh, it comes, I think it's a one ounce product that will last you a long time. So you wanna use either your pinky or your ring finger and you wanna dab it very gently onto the eyelids, both the upper and the lower eyelids. Do not aggressively, harshly rub your eyes. That could potentially increase wrinkles of it. Um, so use, most people will use their ring finger to apply it onto their upper and lower eyelids. I definitely recommend that you wear sunglasses. Uh, sunglasses will help prevent you from squinting. Preventing squinting is super important to, to slow down the process of crow's feet uh, creation. I uh, also recommend that you control your allergies. As of this moment, recording this podcast, it's the spring, and people, this is major allergy season all across the country. Control your allergies because if you're getting that a constant kind of puffiness and reducing a puffiness and inflammation of your eyelids, uh, then that can even potentially have long-term consequences of premature aging of your eyelids. Uh, and I also encourage you to eat a healthy anti-inflammatory type of diet. Uh, it is very common that people tell me that sometimes they wake up in the morning, their eyes are super puffy. Sometimes they eat a certain type of meal and their eyes get real puffy from that. That really is due to inflammation. You know, if you're having a lot of MSG, if you go, let's say, to a fast food restaurant, if you go to a takeout type Chinese restaurant or some of these other ethnic restaurants where they may use a lot of MSG and a lot of salt in the food, uh, then that can definitely cause fluid buildup that over and over again, and the eyelids can stretch out some of that skin, and that can be detrimental as well. So eating a healthy anti-inflammatory diet, like the ones that I have in my book, Younger for Life, that's a great start. Use a retinol eye cream, avoid rubbing your eyes, use those sunglasses, and also make sure you use sunscreen as well. So I hope this was helpful for you. If you've been enjoying my podcast, if you can take just two minutes of your time to leave a rating or review, it definitely helps me spread the word. And as always, I'm Dr. Anthony Yoon, and this is The Dr. Yoon Show. I'm known as America's Holistic Plastic Surgeon. Remember always to eat real food, use clean skincare, and auto-juvenate before you operate. Bye. <laughs>